I figured last week you got a lot of a lot of extra, so I figured I'd just go right in. Um, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to, to to minister to and serve you with God's word. Um, it's, it's also an honor to see the fruit as a result of it. Um, one of the young men from the play, I'm going to mention him, so when he watches it, he'll hear his name. Um, his name is Ephraim. Um, he plays um, David Ruffin. What a phenomenal, phenomenal role and phenomenal actor, talent he is. And um, I had the pleasure to speak to him a little bit after the play. And he told me he'd watched the messages and he said, like, I've never heard you're a little distracted over there and it's distracting me. I never heard, he said, I never heard the word taught like that. And he comes, I believe his father's a pastor and he comes from ministry. So I never heard, he said, I feel like you're talking to me. Like you're just talking, like you're having a conversation, we're just talking. You're talking to me. And that blessed me because, you know, I'm never trying to get up here and do a show. I want to feed you something that you can take and you can use every day and it'll change your life. But to hear somebody from the outside say it affected them the same lets me know that we have a, a purpose and it's bigger, you know, and it's, and again, bigger than these four walls. Amen. And um, that's becoming clear to me that uh, as I consider when and where I will speak, re- you know, whether it be invitations or not, you know, I'm quick to say no when people ask me to come speak places. But um, I'm searching my spirit for what, what time we're in. Why am I bringing this up in the message? This is very important. Say, say with me, every phase of our lives, phase of our lives. has seasons. Now, I want you to understand that because the word season in church has been turned into such a, if you're not careful, corny kind of thing. Well, in God's season, so is their way of saying whether, whether it's been my procrastination or immobility or, or lack of wisdom or knowledge that has prevented me from seeing the move of God, we just throw it under the, the term of it, his season and therefore, that gives us a, a disclaimer out of the excuse for not accomplishing or not being wise enough to be where God wants us to be when he wants us to be there to receive what he has for us. Did I lose anyone? Good. So when I say seasons, I'm not talking about that thing that people use as an excuse for not ever comprehending or receiving what God has laid up for us. When I talk about seasons, I'm talking about the word would be changes, it would be process, it it would be preparation for what God has called you to. Let me give it to you in different terms. If I'm a good trainer, the first thing I would do when I get you in the gym is assess what you could lift or how many push-ups you... I would assess your fitness to determine if you can handle the process, and if not, where should I start? Why would I do that? Well, it's very simple. The mindset of a person is to immediately dump on you what they can do. Especially if I look at you and you look fit. You look strong to me. You look like you're healthy a little bit. You know, do you work out? Yeah, you know, people come in the gym and say, yeah, I work out even if they don't. So I'm like, okay, good. Well, get on this bench and let me just drop this, you know, you know 150 pounds on your chest and let's see how you do. No, a, a real person would, that knows his business will put the ball on you and then he would develop you. A real good trainer will ask you, what's your goal? What do you wish to accomplish? And in what time frame? Why am I bringing this up? You'll see. 
you see. I had the, the opportunity to talk to somebody yesterday who called me for business counsel. And I get these calls, and, and yesterday it just really hit me as I was doing it. You know, you can make a lot of money doing this because you're giving away counsel for free. And I asked a question. Because it was kind of all over the place. Great product, but all over the place. I said, how much do you see yourself making in the next year? And one of the, one of the partners giggled and said, a million dollars. Okay, you're selling things that are like $20 a pop. You're making them by hand, individually. Can you actually make a million dollars worth of product to sell? Is that even physically possible? You're saying stuff as a joke because you don't really believe it. But the truth of the matter is, I asked you a real business at me. What could you really make? How many pieces can you make and sell? And after the expenses, how much would you make? Speak to any wannapreneur or entrepreneur wannabe, and they'll say, a million dollars. Okay, well, there's a process to a million dollars, and if you don't even have a million dollars worth of inventory, how do you expect to make a million dollars? So when people come to me as Christians, and you say, what do you believe in God for? They will say, a million dollars, or success, or to be successful or to have a blessed life. And they'll say these things. And then my question is, well, what is a blessed life? Do you even know what that is? Have you ever sat down and drawn out a map or a blueprint of what a successful life means to you right now in this phase? And if so, do you know the process to get from where you are to where that is? Well, the law to make a way and smack you in the face is what I want to do. Because it's, the, it's these stupid answers that are no accountability whatsoever. You don't really want it. You're wishing. It was too quiet in this room. This, do you don't need this message? Yes. It's wishing. It's, it's, it's throwing churchisms up in the air and hoping they stick and an angel catches one. It, 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 it's not real. Because everything's a process. And when people love to say, God won't put more on you than you can handle, which is not a scripture, by the way. It's, it's a religious quote. It says God will not allow you to be attempted, uh, allow you to be attempted, to be tempted above that which you are able to be, bear. It doesn't say anything about he won't put nothing on you. It doesn't say that. And then if you read it, the whole thing, right, and he says, but in every temptation, he is faithful to provide a way of escape. So it's nothing he puts on you. It's something that you put on yourself or the enemy. But even in that, he's faithful not allow you to take on more than you can handle and always provide you a way of escape. So if you're in it, it's because you ain't found a way out of it, not because God is trying to see what you can take. Now, that's just a side journey, but just keep that. That's free. You can have that. Now, when you come and say, I want to be blessed, and blessed in your spirit has no aim or no direction, you're deceiving yourself. You come into the store and sitting down in my restaurant, if I'm God, and I say, what would you like? And you say, to eat. If you think you, that sounds stupid, go in a restaurant and try it. What would you like today to eat? I'm hungry. Have you looked at the menu? No. Are you going to look at the menu? You have wisdom. You know all things. You just, when you're good and ready, just feed me as you feel led. Right? And after you sat there for a few hours, or maybe if the person was bold enough to go get you something, you wanted with a bunch of junk that you don't really want or don't like or can't eat, you would come to your senses and look at the menu. Mm -hmm. 
My question before you today as we fin- go forward in the great exchange is this. You come in before God to make an exchange or to make a purchase or to make a request or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. What are you bringing and what are you hoping for in return? It's time to stop just saying blessings. Does this help somebody? To be blessed. You're already blessed, so God could just send you out with nothing. You woke up this morning, you're already blessed. Goodbye. Specifically, what is it that you believe in God for? And I'm, there's a balance to this, so hear me out. For me, because the way I am in my walk is based on whatever I know he's already promised me or spoken to me that he wants me to have. Did I just throw a wrench in it or you got it? So when I come before God, I'm not coming before God trying to impose my will on him. I'm only reminding him of what he's promised and spoke over me. And I'm saying to God, what do I need to do or where do I need to be to obtain that which you've promised? Now, he's going to say, I've already tested you. I know what you can lift. Now I need to begin to train you to be able to successfully carry what I've ordained for you. And that's where we're going today. I need, hmm. Do, if not you, have you ever seen somebody get, quote unquote, blessed or promoted and put in a position but because of their lack of preparation, lose it. You can lie on a resume, but once they hire you, they expect you to live up to what you put on that resume. It's easy to lie, but now you got to live up to it. And just after a couple of days watching you, we come to the reality that you can't do what you said you could. So you start giving a bunch of excuses. And they didn't hire you for your excuses. They hired you for your productivity. And so they fire you. Or they let you go. Or you get in the band and then the band throw you out the band because you can't play as good as you said you could play. Now, I've been in situations where I've seen people come to bands I've been in and they can play or they've practiced thoroughly the song that they're going to audition with. So they kill that. And then everything else they suck at, they're out. God wants us prepared so that when he puts us where he's called us to be, we retain the position. The half steps and then failures, well, the Lord had a plan. No, you were not ready. You were a jerk. And hopefully... Through that process, you learn to be prepared the next go round. But not so for church folk. They want to keep winging it. Most of the worst musicians you could ever work with is church musicians. Never want to work with them outside of church. Why? Because a lot of times they get up there and they wing it. They learned enough Christian songs, they get the idea what the beat is, and then you just start playing, and everybody is almost jamming with the concept and then it's like okay that's not the arrangement of the song and that's why they can't work with me because I go that's not the arrangement that's not the right beat if you play one more Teddy Riley beat in this house you know because it ain't even the right beat to the song stop All right, that's not it are you listening to me they didn't prepare they just learned how to play A lot of church people are not prepared for success. They just learn how to play church. They learn how to say things. Pray for me. Oh, the blessings of the Lord. Oh, intercession. Oh, yeah, I'm turning down my plate. All this junk. But Okay, that's the right language. But are you ready for the next level that God has called you to? That's where we're going today. Are we ready? We've talked a lot in the past couple of months about the exchange about where we are and where God wants us to be. Yes? Now I want to talk about your preparation. Are you ready? 
If God promoted you today, could you keep it? If God made the dream you believe it for come true, can you handle it? Are you still doing enough to get by, but not enough to go to the next level? Have you learned how to just maintain where you are, but not take on the next role? Who is quiet in here? I'm a preparation person. Those of you who know me know it. Sometimes I have to I over prepare and God has to say to me, stop preparing now and go do it. Enough preparing now. Do it. How many of you can over prepare? How many say, I don't think I prepare enough? So good. So there's a good flow in all of this for everybody. The wisdom of God is this. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have it. His word promises it. Don't mean we know how to use it. The scripture says the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And for the longest time, I thought that meant there weren't enough laborers. Until I began studying for this message, and it came, I came to the reality, there's plenty of Christians. There's enough Christians to save the whole world. There's not enough skilled laborers. It's not enough prepared laborers. It's not enough people that know how to minister to the needs of other people. So you go to other people and you try to minister to them where you are and not where they are because you don't even know how to determine where they are because all you've done is focused on where you are. I'm sorry, guys. I, you know, I wish I could give you a little more rah-rah, but maybe we'll get there somewhere in. But right now, I need to really plant this foundation. If, if you're being blessed, say amen. amen. Right now... I've come to the realization from talking to some of you and having conversations with you that you have great dreams, which is good. You have great expectation now, which I'm excited about. You're feeling better about your purpose and destiny than you have before. That's exciting to me. Your hopes are stronger than they've ever been. That's exciting to me. Now, what are you called to and are you ready for that promotion when it comes? And that's where we want to go from this phase on of the message. I want to know that you are, are in the place where you're allowing God, are you listening to me? Yes. To train you in the uncomfortable. To train you into that which is not common for you. Right? To allow God to take you out of your comfort zone or your safe place. First, listen to me. Listen to me. First, emotionally and logically, in your spirit, begin to change the way you see things. I'm, if I'm on the phone talking to you and I'm talking to you about business, this is something that I've learned about people quickly, and you've probably heard me say it, but it's true. I find all the time. Whenever I talk to people that are stuck, or they say they're stuck, or they say we want to go forward, but they're not, and I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself, but if you are, you know what I'm talking about. They will immediately begin to tell you why they can't, why it's hard, what other things are in the way. You don't understand what my life is like and what I'm going through. And they will immediately get to enumerate the things that are against them and why they haven't accomplished. Like I said, I want to ask for a show of hands. Well, you can raise your hand if you know somebody who's done that. <laughs> My point is this. You're listening? What I'm about to say is real solid. People that decide to win stop enumerating the shortfalls. People that decide to do it stop telling you all the reasons they can't and why it's hard. No, no, you didn't hear me. People who have decided to do it don't tell you the reasons they can't. They tell you the reasons they can. People who are thinking about doing it will tell you the reasons they can't. And those reasons will always dominate the conversation. 
So what is it that you believe you're called to do? And when the conversation comes up in your spirit between you and God, or you and anybody else, what is your conversation? Let me give you a, a biblical example that you can relate to. Ready? God comes to Abraham and says, you're going to have a baby. What's Abraham's response? I'm too old. My wife's too old. She's been barren for years. There's too many things that goes against this. The doctor said, you know, we're not in our childbearing years. Right? He, he began to enumerate even to God. This is God talking to you. But even to God, he began to enumerate the reasons why it might not be possible. Gideon. What did Gideon do? My, we've been in this bondage for these years. I got to hide eat my food. I'm beating out the wheat in the wine press so they don't find my thing taken. And I'm the least of all my family. That's great people in my family. But I'm the lowest member of them. So if they didn't succeed, what? I don't have that education. All of them have master's degrees. I don't even have a degree. He immediately began to break down to God the criteria that God needed for him to be successful. It's quiet because you know I'm talking to you. When you find yourself telling God what needs to happen for you to be successful, you have not decided yet to be successful. I'm not getting an amen or a burp or nothing today. It's just <laughs> silent. Amen. Preach, man. So, it starts with what you believe inside of you first. God's not the issue. Life's not the issue. It's the way we're seeing ourselves. Stop telling me you believe in for God to bless you and you can't even identify what that is. So I'm starting the message with homework that I want done by the end of the message. I want to know what blessing is to you. What it is that you believe God has in front of you right now to accomplish. Not what you've accomplished. Don't come and tell me, oh, well, I did this, I did that. Okay, yeah, that's yesterday's news. Forgetting those things which are behind, we press forward to the mark of the high calling. What do you believe is your destiny now? Now. What is the thing God has in front of you right now? If you already have your business started, for example, I speak to you, I don't want to hear to, to, to start a, 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 whatever, you know the name of it. It just went blank. Organ, organizing, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, so then what is the steps, what is the next step now? You've already done that. Incorporations, all that's done. whoop de doo Now what's the number? Did God give you one? What are the steps you want to take to get to that number? What do you believe they are? Because you got to then come to God so he can say wrong, 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 and wrong. And then he'll tell you what he wants to do. But at least you have something. He may say right, 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 and right. A lot of times he'll say wrong most of the time. He'll say, what you, I've called you to do, you're right. And all the stuff you believe in for, you're right. But all the ways you plan to do it, wrong, 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 and wrong. Because I'm God and I'm going to do it my way. And his way is, and his way is, and his way is, now, come on, say it like you mean it, and his way is, amen, it is better. It's easier too, once you, once you learn. Easy too, what you learn. I didn't mean to put this in the message, but I was going to, I'm going to throw it in there. So, started working on the, the graphic work, started talking to them this company about doing in India to do the graphics, the, the 3D animation for me around December. We set a release date for April. Actually paid the guy in March. So I was procrastinating a little bit. God, this is thousands of dollars. And I don't know if I want to spend my thousand dollars on this. I don't want to be sure it's you. I don't know if it, what if it don't work. And I'm going back and forth trying to get God to give me a green light. Come on, saints. 
should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? Should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? Should I spend this money? I don't want to invest money. And I don't want to waste money. And didn't get an answer. You know, you know when God don't give you an answer? Yeah, see, I hear some of you giggling. Yeah, you know what? You know that thing you keep praying and praying and praying and God don't answer? Yes. Yeah. You, you know why? You know why, they, you know why he don't answer you? Huh? She, she said, asking the wrong question. What else? He already told you. You already know what you're supposed to do, and he's just not going to say it again. You already know. You already know. I'm not going to keep answering the dumb question that I already answered you. I told you, go ahead and do this. Well, God, how should I get this? Should I get that? Should I go ahead? Should I go on the Saturday? Should I go on the right? You ain't even packed to go. Don't ask what day. I already told you, go. That's all you need. Just start moving like you're going, and I'll show you how you're going to get there. But start moving. I believe I'm going here. I, I, this is a different story, but I remember people were making fun of me and Angela because we didn't know where we were going, nor did we have money to go. And every box, we had everything in our house packed in boxes sitting in the hallway, and we didn't even know where we were going and how we were going to get there. And people were like, why you got your stuff packed? Because we moving. So how you going to move? I don't know. What you believe for a house? Well, where you going to stay? I don't know. And then we wound up getting evicted, and the marshals came, and they came in the house, and they saw all the boxes packed. They said, oh, you guys are all ready to go. Well, just tell us where you want us to take the stuff. We'll just take it there. I didn't see it like that at the moment, because I was still trying to tell God what to do. But let me get off of that. We go back to the story at hand. Without going to all the details, they just began dragging their feet and jerking me around. I paid in March for something that's supposed to be done in April. I just got it last week. And I got it because I had to get legal. I had to get gangster. I had to come hard. I had to do mean things. I pretty much had to jam up his whole financial future and jeopardize him in ways that I can do if you mess with me like that. I'm very good with legal stuff, and I know how to hurt you if you make me hurt you. He made me hurt him. He made me hurt him. I didn't want to do it. And I was in conflict with the Christ in me. At least I thought I was. I was really in conflict with the, the guilt or the flesh in me. The Christ in me, shit, I really hurt him. It's like, you paid this man. Yeah. Do what you need to do. You're not trying to hurt him, but you're a businessman. I trained you in this way. Do what you need to do. So now I'm getting texts and emails. I can't feed my family. You've heard us such a way. I'm like, okay. Yeah, give me my stuff. Get me my stuff, and I'll take the hurt off of you. But during the course of those two weeks of going back and forth and then him sending me stuff, but it ain't the right stuff, but he figured I was too dumb to know because I don't really know graphics and 3D animation, that I'll send you this bunch of files that are not the right files, and you won't be able to know. You think you got your stuff, and then you release the money and stuff, but I already have a client that we staff for that happens to be an animation company, and I send all the files to them, and they open them up and say, they're empty files, there's nothing in them, they're just files, there's nothing in them. So I was like, wow, you, you really playing me. And I mean, it, it, let me just tell you, I can feel my pressure going up the stress level. I can feel the throbbing in my head. It's like, if I just, I'm willing to pay to get on the plane to go to India just to whip you, <laughs> just, just to beat you, you know, just, just, to, just to punch you. And, 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 and just, to, just the, uh, you know, the frustration of it all. And, and God's just saying, is it in my hands or in your hands? Well, that was a rough one because you told me to do the do, and I'm doing the do, and in doing the do, I feel some feelings and emotions about this thing. Come on, y'all. But I stood back, I held my ground. Didn't like doing that. Didn't like hurting people like that, but I held my ground. Finally, after almost a week of denying that he had done what he'd done, he sent me a list of files that the guy told me on Monday that he, I needed. He said, no, you don't. And then on Thursday, he sent the exact list 
we'll try this and see if it works. And the guy said, yes, now we have everything we need. And then I sent him, released the upfront money. And I'm telling you this for a reason. I'm sitting there and I'm just frustrated, never dealing with this guy again, just, just what he did, all this kind of stuff. And God said, you negotiated through your, your deal and you brought it home. So I'm never going to deal with that again. Never, ever, ever. And God said, you, you're whining about something that worked out in your benefit. You're not listening to me. I walked you through something. It was uncomfortable to your flesh. You didn't like it. It was irritating and frustrating to you. But you accomplished something. You've learned how you got to deal with people like this to bring business to pass. You will deal with it again if you want to be what I've called you to be. These shifty, underhanded, lying, conniving people exist in your field. Stop feeling frustrated. Take it as this is what goes with the game. What did I just say? If you want God to move you to the next level, he's going to prepare you to be able to lift these weights. This is what it is. You're in this field. This is what they do. I'm teaching you what you will deal with. Stop being upset about it and just accept the win. And in his last email, he said to me, you won, we lost. He said that. So you, you, I'm saying, there ain't no game. I ain't playing no game. God, it is the game. If you want to go to this level, are you listening to me, Mitchell? This is the game. Now, let me just show you. Ready? Here's where, here's where you get to go really wild. It is. I had to be something brutal. You would have been like, Pastor Dag, you're going to do that? I had to be something brutal. I had to go all Trump on him. I didn't feel good about that. But it accomplished what I needed to do. As soon as he did what he's supposed to do, I let his money go. I froze his bank. You don't even want to know. I hurt him. I hurt him bad. As soon as he got in line, gave him what he was supposed to have. Now, I'm doing the rest of my business now with this company here in America that I was working with. So I, so, I speak, so I speak to the guy on the phone. He said, okay, we got the graphics from you. We got all the 3D animation that you needed. Now we just need to finalize the video, put it together, blah, 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 blah. How much is that going to cost? He said, five grand. I said, I want to do five grand. We got a relationship. We work together. Come on. Come on. He said, all right, 3,500. I'll take 3,500. He said, well, because you got all the animation, we just need to do da, 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 da. And he's breaking down the details of what he needs to do. He said, but because you got all this animation... It's making it a lot easy for us. We can give you this kind of deal. So I asked a question. Just curious. If I didn't get this animation done before I came to you, how much would you have charged me to do this whole project? $20,000. So the frustration this guy put me over a couple of months for the $1,000 saved me nineteen. dollars You get it? So while I was feeling frustrated and drained out, I was saving 19 grand. So now the next time I have to deal with somebody near a jerk like that, I already know this is what you do. I already know what I need to do back to you. And we'll just go through the process and I get my stuff and I'll save me a lot of money. So would I do business with him again? Yes, I will. But you already know, come into the game, if you screw with me, I'm going to hurt you. We have an understanding now. It should go much smoother next time. You follow what I'm saying? But it's a process, listen to me, that I didn't want to go through. Even though I'm telling you about it, I feel sick to my stomach. This guy was driving me crazy. Every week promising me, next week I for sure, I promise you. Trust me, I will never let you down. Every week, I kept getting these emails. Oh, no, something came up. There was a flood, but we're, we're pumping out the water. But trust me, next week, believe me. Uh, please understand, PLZ. Please understand. Trust me, I will never let you down. And I just kept getting that email every week for months and months and months. 
So when I froze up his money, and he kept saying, please, I need my money, I'm in trouble, this and that, and I said, please understand, trust me, yes, exactly, please understand, I will send you your money, trust me, I will never let you down, send. He got back, but you know, my family, this, my wife, this, but this, this, please understand, trust me, I will never let you down, send. Now we can't pay the bills, we may lose our home. Please understand. <laughs> Trust me, I will never let you down. Bam! It's coming. It's coming. Now, I owe him a balance of 800 bucks. I send him 200 Monday. I need more. Tomorrow I will send him another 200. With please understand, it's coming. Trust me. I will never let you down. He got nasty with me in the email. I said, send me one more disrespectful email and I will send you $50 a week until you are paid. Trust me, I will never let you down. Now see, that, that's a side of me. We laugh, but that wasn't comfortable for me to do that. I froze his livelihood. I messed him up bad. And I didn't feel good doing that. And I still don't, even as I'm telling you the story and we're laughing. But it's the process if you're going to deal with wolves. But we don't want to do that. We don't want confrontation. We don't even want people to disagree with us. Oh, we're so fragile and so touchy and so temperamental and so emotional and, and so sissy. Come on, y'all. Can I have a real talk? We're just so touchy about everything. Everything hurts our feelings. Oh, my God, my feelings. And it's like I had to, it was hard for me to stay out of my feelings and do what I had to do. Are you learning something here? I know this ain't regular Sunday church talk, but this is real talk. Now I have a better understanding if I have to go this route again. I understand the business. You hear what I'm saying, Cheryl, right? I understand the business of what I got to do now. I, all the emotions won't be attached to it this time like last time. I won't be staying up at night and can't sleep and waking up in the morning and feeling sick to the stomach and feeling like I'm a bad guy. No, I, okay, I'm doing business the way I need to do business. My heart never turned evil. But I had to be wise as serpents but gentle as doves. I needed to do what God needed me to do to become the next phase of what he's calling me to be. Yeah. Say it. I need to do need what to do. God needs me to do to, to, to become what he wants me to be. It may not be comfortable. I didn't plan to go that long with that, but I just really want to bring that home. I'm glad you like. Did you, if you appreciate it, just give the Lord a hand clap and this, we'll move on. <laughs> Whew. I, need, I need to stop and take a breather after that. I'm telling you, I still feel residue. <sighs> Man, that was, a, that was a journey. And you don't know, because I don't get up here and whine, but I stay, to, I stay through to the end. Are you listening to me? Yes. Say it. I stay in it stay to the end. No turning back, no fainting, no feeling sorry for myself. I stay through to the end. Right up your alley, huh, Mike? It's a life lesson, baby. We left off with James, if any of you lack wisdom. Let him ask God to give all men liberally and upbraid him not. Um, I want to go to Matthew now, 11, verse 25. Matthew 11, verse 25. If you can go there with me, I would greatly appreciate it. Are you there? Yes, 1125. 
I don't think there's a 35, is there? No, there's not. Um, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O God, O Father of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, but has revealed them to, unto babes. Even so, for it seemed good in your sight, this is Jesus talking to daddy, all things are delivered unto me of the father, and no man knoweth the son but the father, neither knoweth any man the father except the son. You listening? And he, and he to who, whomever the son will reveal him. That means you the, you listen, let, me, let me explain it simple. So he said, no man knows the son but the father and those who the father reveals the son to. So in other words, nobody knows who the son is but the father and who he gives the liberty or the blessed opportunity to have him reveal. Nobody knows who he is unless I tell them who he is. Simple put. So, no, no, I don't want you to just to take this lightly. Nobody knows who the Lord is except the Father and those who he reveals him to. Here's what I'm saying to you. Simply put, one sentence. Listen close to what I'm saying. You are privileged to know who the Lord is. And that's why when you try to preach to your unsaved people and they don't get it and you get frustrated, I don't know if I'm preaching right, you can't preach nobody into salvation. You can just leave the seed there. But until the Lord reveals, you, they ain't going to know. That's why a lot of people so-called get saved by religion or by church or because they're going through a bad time and they went to church because they was in trouble and they went there looking for a genie God. But the Lord never got revealed to them. So when they preach messages, they say stuff and do stuff in message. And you go, wait a minute, I thought he was a, a Christian believer. How is he now teaching um, all these other foreign religions and stuff. I thought this was the man of God. Wait a minute. H how is he into to earthism and everything now? Because the Lord wasn't revealed to him. He accepted the religion. He accepted the religion. My daddy preached for years. That's how the family survived. Now I'm a preacher. I preach. I know how to preach. I know how to say this stuff. Now this is nobody in particular. I'm just trying to tell you, I've, I've met pastors like that. And I ask them, are they born again? They look at me like I'm stupid. But that's, see, that's a matter of opinion right there. I asked a pastor one, one time, a Christian pastor, this guy was getting into an argument with, with him in front of me about who killed Jesus, the Jews or the Romans. And he said, well, he, you know, you can't take the Bible literally. And he went on to start to explain that. And I'm like, he had his white collar on and everything. And I was like, you, you what? See, it's, it's, all of, it's all in the opinion how you look at it. And I went, wow. So this is your job. Yes. This is your occupation. Your pastor is your occupation. It's not your faith. Right, right. It's not what you really believe. This is not what you know to be true. This is your job. Respect. Whatever. Maybe you preach enough to get some people really saved. And God will use you. But as for you, I don't know where your ending is going to be. And it's not my problem to figure it out. The Lord reveals. So this is the point. We are seed planters. The, the, the seed, some plant, some water, God brings forth the increase. Real revelation of salvation comes from God, not from you. Just a side journey, a load off of you. But he says, whomever the Son, whosoever the Son will reveal him. So he is seeing and showing us that we don't know the Father Save the Son, and whoever the Son will reveal him. So now, God reveals the Son to us, and the Son reveals God to us. Get, you get it? Let me say it again. So, the Son is revealed to us because God gives us the privilege 
to be, have it revealed to us, whether we're hungry, we search, whatever the case. Then the son says, now let me introduce you to the father. I don't think you're getting it. Let me try it one more time. God's saying you can't know the son unless I reveal him to you. But in the process, you don't know me. And you can't know me without the son. So let me introduce you to my son so my son can introduce you to me. That's a, pro- that's a process here. Let me introduce you to the son so that the son can introduce you to me and then you have a real fellowship. Now you have a relationship. But it's an honor that you've been introduced. You got it? You're going to sit home and that's going to click for you. I, 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 some of you are still looking around like, mm, you'll figure it out. No man knows the father except the son and whom he reveals. Jesus said, no one comes unto the Father except by me. Yet, the Father is intervening to get you connected by first introducing you to the Son, even though you don't know the Father. Are you getting it now? He don't have to have nothing to do with you. You don't know me, and no one comes to me except the Son. So you know what? I'm going to introduce you to the Son so the Son can introduce you to me so that we can all have this fellowship together now. So God kind of cheating the deal. He laid the plan, but then he made you a back door. You're still not getting that, huh? I'm going to move on. You're coming to that. I'm just blown away by that, that he went out of his way to stack the deck in my favor. That he told me I can't get into the sun, and I didn't believe in the sun, so there was no way I was getting in. And then he made a way to introduce the sun to me, even though he's not even supposed to be involved right now, because me and him are not supposed to have a relationship at all. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and introduce you so I can get you in here. I'm just blown away by that. that. To me, that just blows my mind. Now, after going through all of that explanation, then he says, Come unto me, all ye that are laid Lay, that I labor and I heavy laden and I will give you rest this verse I can preach on for the next three months come unto me all of you are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest now let, let, let's, let's look at this in the Amplified I mean, I lost my verse. What verse was that again? 11.28, right? Mm -hmm. I switched Bibles and it jumped all the way back to the beginning. Come unto me, or you will labor, and heavy laden, and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. Does that speak it a little clearer? How many of you have felt heavy laden and labored come on let's be real right he just said you don't have to be and he said you don't have to be because father interjected introduced you to the son and the son introduced you now back to the father and then because of that you can come to me if you're labored and heavy laden and burden and give it to me so this goes back to what the Lord don't put more on you he just clearly said no coming to me I want to give you rest so, so a God who wants to give you rest can't want to give you labor sometimes you got to go through the hard time well, then God need to make up his mind he either want me to rest or he want me to have labor according to this word spoken by Jesus by the way who I think would kind of know a little bit, says God wants you to rest. Somebody say with a loud voice, God wants me to rest. rest. Now your flesh will fight that a little bit because you've learned religiously for so many years that God needs you to go through it, that God got to prove you, (laughs) and he got to see what you're going to do. In the hot time, huh? if you're going to stay huh, with Jesus. Uh, right? See, you, all is right. You heard that for so long on so many of the Christian channels that we find it hard to believe that God wants us to rest. 
Well, Pastor, I'm not resting. No, you don't believe you're supposed to. Huh. That's a good way to put it, Father. You'll come home into your house, those of you who have homes that you love, and you go in that house, and you kick off your shoes, and you have your routine. Whether it's the living room TV, the bedroom TV, whatever you turn on. Some people love to cook. They head straight to the kitchen. They start cooking. That's where they find their rest. But you had to do something to build that place that you can get to rest in. But that's not supposed to be laborious and, and killing you and driving you crazy. It's just a process to get to that place. So, so I, I'm sure you enjoy your kitchen very much. But we remember when it wasn't a kitchen. Remember, we remember it wasn't even no floor. We had to step across the, the beam so that we didn't fall into the basement, right? So now there are floors and counters and stuff and cabinets. And that process and the word spoken. Oh, it's going to turn around. This is God going to fix this. We'll learn some things. But he's going to fix this. So you saw that was a labor, but it was a labor of love. It wasn't a labor that burdened you and made you heavy laden until you did the things where you did, weren't obedient, and then people start screwing over your money, and so it goes. So, but the process, once you got in the process, process floating. Everything's a process. You will carry some things. You will build. You will construct. You will be a part of God's process of making things change. But if you know that that's what you're called to do and you know the outcome, you don't consider that labor. You consider things labor and heavy laden when you're doing a bunch of things that you hate doing, don't want to do, but you're forced to do it because you figure that's the only way you can survive. Ooh, it got quiet again. And he said, I want you to rest. So let me just say this. Rest starts first in the realm of the spirit before it hits the, uh, the, the, the soulless realm or the financial realm. This is, I'm going to wrap it up because we're come running out of time. But I want to just bring this home. Say, rest, rest. starts within me. You can rest if you know what, why you're doing what you're doing. You can rest if you have a hope and an expected end. If you know the outcome of what you're doing, what it's bringing you to, yes? yes? So I've had to say to people several times. I remember one time when Lindsay first took her job in sales. She was so upset. She was so frustrated because she was like, I don't know anything about this. And I just feel like I'm not doing well and I don't know how to do it. And I kept saying to her, God put you there to learn something. Stop talking about what you can't do and learn the skill set God put you there to learn. There's a reason you are there. Stay still. Once she embraced it, it stopped being labor. Because now and I'm not coming to work because I hate coming to work. I'm coming to work because I'm here to get something. I said, you're basically in school and being paid to be in school. Go to school. Learn your craft. Because God's going to use it later. I remember when I first spoke to Pastor Fontaine, your son, and said to him, you're called to be an administrator. And he was going to school for forensic, and he wanted to work in pet land. He wanted to be a pet detective, right? And I'm like, no, your calling is administration. And he told me later, I said to myself, this man's an idiot. He don't know what he's talking about. This is not my desire. And ever since then, he's been successful in <laughs> making big money now in and loves it. Loves it. This is process. That's not labor. Men and women of God even when you're in the will of God, it's labor when you don't know why you have to do something. That's frustrating. 
When you're doing something and you think you should be doing something. Are you listening to me today? I'm bringing it home. This is the, this is the grand finale. I'm about to kick my legs up. Fat lady's about to sing. It's, it's, it's about to go down. So pay attention. It's labor and frustration because at the season of the life you're in, you don't know why you're there and what you're there for. So now you're frustrated by it. But if you're paying attention to the syllabus and you know what the outcome is in the final grade is, it's not a struggle. You're working towards something. Now I don't struggle with it. So now what I just went through, which I felt was just months and months of just unbearable frustration, I realized was an education. Something I learned. This time it won't go for a month. Two weeks in, you started, I'm going to shut you down. I know what to do. And I'm going to let you know, okay, I know how to stop you. you. You really want this? This is the process. Well, I believe the Lord is just going to hold my hand and just walk me into tender gardens and flowers and leaves blowing. Yeah, okay, in this world, there is tribulation. But be of good cheer I know how to get you through it. I know how to overcome it. I have overcome it. Are you listening to me? So we can't, hmm, Lord, how do I say this in the nicest way possible? We really just are too attached to how things affect us emotionally. Is that clear enough to say? We are just really too caught up in me too when I say we I mean me how things move me personally or emotionally that a lot of times I miss the spiritual attributes that I'm gaining from the process we get so hot you know talk to me <clears throat> nah, uh, mm, I ain't staying there I ain't having nobody mm, mm, mm. and it's like okay is it really that uncomfortable if you won't come out of it with a million dollar skill set really the problem is you don't know where you are and why you're there. You have no goals. You're just waiting for Jesus to bless you. With no training. With no preparation. What must it have been like for Noah to have to build an ark? And it's nowhere recorded that he was a boat builder. And, and just for the record, he didn't have John Deere tractors and cranes and stuff. It took years to build that boat. So the ridicule and the people telling him he's stupid and he's crazy and he ain't heard from God wasn't just for a month. It may have been 10 years it took him to build that boat. We don't know, but I know this. I know how long it takes to build one with modern equipment and it's not a week. Okay, I need you to understand the reality of what I'm saying to you. He had to build a carnival cruise ship by himself. It wasn't a boat with oars in a row or a sailboat because he had to put one of each animal, two of each animal on the boat. It had to be strong enough to hold two elephants. I don't even know if that technology existed back then. He had to build a boat that was, okay, this ain't in the Columbus days. They stole his blueprints from the patent office. Okay, he was building boats when you didn't even hear about boats. I, that might be the first boat ever built. And he built a ship, a cruise liner, huge, from bottom to the top. And from what I can see, I don't know if he had a crew or not, if he had to do it by itself. Bible doesn't say. But even with the crew, that's a lot of work. It took him, I'm guaranteeing you, at least five to ten years to build that thing. And have the ridicule of the people who didn't believe him consistently every time he came out of his house to go build his boat. But he knew his agenda. He understood his outcome. He knew why he was where he was doing what he was doing. And so for him, it's not labor because you understand why God has you, where he has you, and what he's developing you for, where he has you. 
Most of us right now, my final sentence is, you're hurting and you're dismayed and feeling confusion because you don't know where you are in life and what it's preparing you for. So you have no clue. You're just waking up from day to day and going to bed with the labors of life on you, not knowing the purpose and saying, well, God just going to bless someday. And you don't even know what you're doing. And that's why it's in this season is important for us to get in the training. What is the training? So many of y'all are just too sensitive. God don't even send me to your words because your feelings get hurt or you got to defend where you are. That's the deepest thing. No, but the reason I'm not there, Pastor, but, no, but you don't really understand. Oh, so you're trying to defend your lack? You need to explain it to me? So then you're good there then. If you want to spend time explaining why you are where you are, then you don't want to leave it. Oh, man, this is the quietest day we ever had in this church. My God. I guess you'll you'll be doing a vote to get a new pastor right about now. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying, though? Where are you right now? Stop telling me you believe in to be blessed. What do you believe in to be blessed with? Do you even know what the process is? Do you know how far along in the process you are? If you find that out, all the weight comes off of you. It's time for us to grow past doing enough to get by and hoping that tomorrow is better. It's time to get past that. That's not living, that's existing. You'll bear witness with me? We're bigger than this. We had that last week, right? We're better than this, yes? We're beyond this regular mortal life, yes? We're greater than this, yes? We're greater than this, yes? We're greater than this, yes? I am not having a church relationship with God. Not having a church relationship with God. I have to have an intimate personal relationship with God. I don't want none. I do not want to be a church folk. Quoting cliches and no noticeable difference in their life from anybody else. How many of you agree with me? So here's where we take this real. You're not where you are by accident. Either it's part of God's plan or it's part of your foolishness. One of the two. But either way, God knows how to bring you out. Whether you got there by his leading or you got there by your stupidity, he knows, how, he knows the way escape, of escape. He knows how. But we need to know where we are. When you're in the mall and you're lost and you don't know where you are, you go look for that map. What's the first thing you look for when you find that map? You are here. That whole map means nothing if you can't identify where you are. This season, this, this, this session, this time, and like I said, season is not four, five, six months. Season right here today. Where are you? God will show you if you ask. Where are you on the map? What's your next step going to take you to? Where are you ultimately going to end up? Pastor out.